Great. Well, it's um, very nice to see you all here. My name is Steve Panfil, and I'm a technical advisor for Red Plus at Conservation International, uh, based in Washington. And um, I think we've got quite an interesting and uh, an exciting uh, panel today about a subject that has been discussed for quite a while and perhaps isn't getting quite as much uh, attention as, uh, as it really uh, should have. Um, but following last year's Warsaw decisions on RED, we're now really entering into the operational phase of RED. And uh, one evidence of this is that we're seeing, uh, we saw the, the submission of a reference level on RED by Brazil uh, in June of last year. And here during this COP, we'll see the submissions, uh, presentations of at least uh, four more countries' uh, reference levels. And, uh, and I think that these are really exciting signs that RED is starting to move forward. Um, and uh, similarly, on the uh, funding side, we're seeing some important progress as well. So you've probably heard about the very significant pledges that have been made to the Green Climate Fund, uh, uh, right around uh, $10 billion now. Um, and the Green Climate Fund also recently uh, uh, adopted a, a framework for uh, funding uh, results uh, based, or making results based payments for RED. Um, so things are really starting to, to move forward, uh, and this is an exciting thing. Um, uh, but at the same time, um, we're not at a point where national RED programs are set in stone. Uh, there are still um, significant uh, pieces that are being uh, implemented, developed uh, in the, at the national scale. Um, and we thought we as organizers of this event, which include the CBD Secretariat, uh, the Forest Carbon Markets and Communities Program of USAID, uh, the UNEP, WCMC, and Conservation International. We felt this is really a good time to try to bring up this uh, issue of biodiversity conservation in RED again. It's something that uh, all of our organizations have been paying attention to for a long time. It's one of the things that drove a lot of the interest in RED uh, way back when RED was just beginning at the, at the concept stage. Um, and yet it is uh, perhaps not something that has been getting as much attention recently. Um, and um, so we've got, we're going to organize ourselves through two uh, segments to this uh, panel. Um, and so I'm going to introduce first the, uh, the speakers from the first portion of the panel. And, um, and we'll start with some introductory comments from each of them. I'll give them each about uh, eight minutes or so and then I'll uh, ask them each a question or two, uh, and then we'll pass on uh, to the second segment of the panel, which, um, and you'll see that the, the first part is, is perhaps a sort of a higher level international perspective on this really important issue, and the second part is going to be going into a little bit more, more detail and some examples of how um, some of these synergies between red and biodiversity conservation um, can be achieved. Um, so for the first segment, I'm very pleased here to have uh, Mr. Braulio Ferreira de Souza Diaz, who is the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, we have uh, Mr. Gabriel Quijandria, who's the Vice, President, uh, Vice Minister of Natural Resources Strategic Development uh, for the uh, Ministry of the Environment here in Peru. Um, and we have His Excellency uh, Pajero Prasetyo, who is the head of the National Red Agency in Indonesia. Um, so we'll, we'll begin with uh, Mr. Diaz. Thank you. Good afternoon to all. So the discussion here, from my perspective, is to discuss the, the plus. So we talk about red plus. So it should uh, go beyond just uh, 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 promoting uh, uh, actions to reduce uh, uh, carbon emissions uh, and avoidance of deforestation, for example, and conservation, restoration actions, but it should look at other uh, co-benefits. So biodiversity is one of these co-benefits co that we hope to see from Red Plus uh, initiatives. Uh, and as you know, much of the biodiversity in the world is in forests, so there's a lot of opportunities for win-win solutions, but there's not always a coincidence of where you have more carbon and where you have more biodiversity. So we have to really take into account the best information available about biodiversity so that we can really explore these win-win opportunities. Uh, 
two months ago in Korea, we launched the GBO4. Mm -hmm. So this is the latest information about the status and trends of biodiversity globally. And as you know, we are working to promote the implementation of the strategic plan for biodiversity, uh, which runs to 2020, which is the uh, global UN uh, agenda. So this is not just the agenda of the CBD, but it's an agreed agenda of the other biodiversity-related conventions and all the UN agencies, and also major international organizations, so IUCN, BirdLife International, uh, uh, WWF, CI, uh, all these big organizations are also working and uh, utilizing this as, as their framework. So this report uh, has two main messages. One, that yes, we... Uh, 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 acknowledge that there has been an increase in efforts to implement the uh, IHE biodiversity targets. But the, the second and main conclusion is that current actions are not enough. So if we don't scale up or speed up the actions towards uh, implementation, we will not meet uh, most of the IHE targets by the end of the decade. So we still have six years to go. Uh, at our last COP, we adopted uh, a number of decisions to help increase the efforts. These were uh, labeled the Pyongyang, Pyongyang Roadmap, uh, which uh, includes decision on resource mobilization, cooperation, technical and scientific cooperation, and other aspects uh, which the parties to the CBD agreed to enhance their actions. Clearly, resource mobilization is uh, one of the key elements to promote uh, implementation and the establishment of incentives such as payment for ecosystem uh, and uh, uh, specifically the Red Plus is a, a, relev a very relevant uh, uh, initiative for us. Uh, just to mention briefly, Red Plus, we believe Red Plus could contribute to help us implement maybe half of all the 20 IEG biodiversity targets. So we're talking about target two which is to incorporate the values of biodiversity in national accounts and national policies. Target three, to review the uh, economic instruments and subsidies to reduce those with perverse impact and increase those with uh, positive impact. We're talking about target five, which is to reduce deforestation. Target uh, uh, 11, to increase protected areas. Uh, uh, target 12, to uh, reduce extinction of, of the species. Target 13, to reduce loss of genetic diversity. Target 14, to safeguard uh, uh, ecosystems that provide essential ecosystem services. Target 15, which is to uh, restore degraded uh, ecosystems. Uh, target 18, which is to protect traditional knowledge and the holders of these knowledge. So these are all, uh, so Red Plus potentially could contribute to all the, the achievement of all these targets. At uh, COP12 in Korea, we adopted a resource mobilization decision to double international flows for developing countries by 2015 compared to the baseline of, 20, uh, between, of the years between 2006 and 2010, but also a target to increase domestic resource mobilization everywhere, and also a decision about safeguards in developing new financial mechanisms for biodiversity. So this is important because uh, the, under the CBD, parties recognize the need to fully respect the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities in implementing new financial mechanisms such as Red Plus. So I think uh, the CBD has put in place a number of uh, decisions and, and initiatives that can complement very much and help support implementation of Red Plus. And uh, I want to end by um, calling uh, for all of you to help us raise the attention uh, as we progress towards the uh, Paris meeting uh, in a year's time to highlight the relevance of the uh, land use agenda to contribute to uh, achieve the necessary targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So I believe that we have been paying perhaps too much attention to the agenda on energy, housing, transportation, which is important, and perhaps not giving enough attention to the agenda on land use. And that's where the CBD, 
the CCD and other process can, can help contribute, and, and uh, I want all the help from all of you to highlight the, the, the opportunities for this agenda. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very pleased next to be able to um, introduce Mr. Kihandria, the Vice Minister from, from Peru, to give us a little bit of a perspective about the country that we're in right now. Muchas gracias, Steve. I, I will shift to, to Spanish. Um, en primer lugar, bueno, quiero disculparme, yo voy a tener que salir más o menos 6 y 20, tengo que ir a atender otro, otro evento porque el ministro está atendiendo otra cosa. Pero quiero agradecer la, la oportunidad de estar aquí y de comentar un poco eh, lo que hemos venido haciendo en el, en, en el Perú en, en este intento de, de tener un, un enfoque integral respecto de la, de la gestión del bosque y cómo evitar eh, el riesgo que existe de carbonizar eh, la visión del bosque ¿no? y de entender al bosque únicamente como un, como un medio para, para este, fijar el carbono y perder de vista los otros valores, las otras funciones que el, que el bosque tiene y que son sí, igualmente importantes y que tienen... Eh, o sea, tienen además incluso convenciones específicas de Naciones Unidas que reconocen este valor, pero que, que eventualmente no han tenido suficiente eh, engancho, suficiente búsqueda de sinergia, de sinergia hasta el momento. ¿no? Entonces, desde, desde el gobierno tenemos esa idea de entender el bosque como, como un elemento que, que, que está vinculado a una serie de servicios ecosistémicos, como la fijación de carbono, como la regulación hídrica, como la provisión de, de determinados me, este, medios de vida, como este, la, la, la generación de, de, o lo, el aporte de determinados, de, no solo servicios, sino también bienes ambientales, eh, como, eh, y eh, entender, entender ese, esa, esa integralidad a partir de eh, buscar articulaciones entre estas formas distintas de abordar el bosque. Deberíamos poder, en un mundo ideal, tener una, un acercamiento integrado y una visión que permitiese ver, eso sería lo ideal, ¿no? las diferentes eh, facetas del bosque al mismo tiempo, pero de alguna forma tenemos que poder cortarle realidad y, y darle este, alguna, alguna racionalidad. Por eso es que tenemos convenciones dedicadas al tema de diversidad biológica, al tema de cambio climático, al tema de desertificación, tenemos un foro de bosques de Naciones Unidas. El tema es, eh, entendiendo la necesidad de tener esta partición de la realidad, no perder de vista que necesitamos reintegrarla este, también a, ni, a nivel conceptual y no perder este, de, de, de vista eh, la necesidad de ver este, toda, toda la figura completa. Eh, nosotros este año hemos estado, además de, de, de la organización de esta COP, en un proceso de actualización eh, en simultáneo de nuestras tres estrategias de las convenciones de Río. Eh, un proceso que en alguna medida intentamos que fuese eh, coordinado, que tuviese algún vínculo en, entre sí. No lo ha sido lo suficiente, ha sido más coordinado que los procesos de las versiones anteriores, pero, pero sentimos que todavía hay la necesidad de generar esta conexión, esta interfase, este cosido, si quieren, o sea, poder coser eh, las, las estrategias entre sí para que tengan alguna, alguna lógica de continuidad. Estamos trabajando en ese momento, por ejemplo, lo que tiene que ver en el vínculo entre cambio climático y diversidad biológica, una estrategia intermedia, una estrategia de bosques y cambio climático, que, que es o respondería a lo, que, a lo que en otros países se ha denominado estrategia red, estrategia nacional red. La idea es que oh, esta, okay, esta estrategia no, no, pueda yeah. eh, generar los vínculos yeah. entre, entre los temas de, de diversidad biológica, en los temas de bosques y los temas este, red, y, y pueda este, ayudarnos a mejorar esta, esta coordinación, esta articulación entre estas visiones eh, que, que, que tenemos este, al, al, al mismo tiempo, ¿no? viniendo desde la diversidad biológica, desde, desde la, la gestión de, de, de los temas de cambio climático también. Hemos avanzado también en, en, en algunos eh, trabajos analíticos, justo en, en, un, en un evento anterior se ha presentado esta, un poco los resultados de esta publicación, donde con, con el apoyo de, de UNEP y de, de, de Red Pack se ha trabajado en eh, la utilización 
de eh, mapas para poder determinar beneficios ambientales y sociales y cómo están, cómo eh, ver la superposición y la coincidencia de valores de diversidad biológica con valores en, en, en el tema de, de fijación de carbono, en el tema de generación de, de, de otros tipos de, de servicios y bienes ecosistémicos y ver cómo, cómo poder manejar esta, esta, esta superposición y buscar eh, estrategias que permitan eh, potenciar, permitan la sinergia, permitan potenciar intervenciones orientadas este, a atender estas, 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 estas agendas este, que están, que están eh, muy, muy fuertemente vinculadas. Eso no se ha quedado simplemente en el análisis, en realidad el análisis realizado ha servido también durante el proceso de formulación de un, de un programa eh, de, de trabajo en el tema red que, 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 que se ha aprobado también este, el, el año pasado. Para, es el programa de inversión forestal del, del Climate Investment Funds para, para Perú, donde se hizo un proceso de identificación de, 10, de 15 zonas, o 15 frentes de deforestación, hotspots de deforestación, y, 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 y se, utilizando parte de esta información se, se ha determinado finalmente, este, el, el, el programa tiene una intervención sobre tres de estos hotspots, pero parte del proceso de selección de los hotspots incluyó eh, darle una importancia grande a las zonas de traslape con alto valor de diversidad biológica, con alta potencialidad para la generación de medios de vida y, y, y se priorizó la intervención en, esto, en estos ámbitos específicos. O sea, alta concentración de carbono, alta concentración de este, otros elementos de diversidad biológica, alta concentración de, la, de, de alto potencial de, de livelihoods y de, de, además de, 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 de existencia de comunidades eh, nativas, de comunidades locales que utilizaban estos, estos, estos elementos. ¿no? O sea, eso eso ha, ido, ha ido un poco por ese lado. Eh, esto un poco ha... ha intentado pues re reflejar eh, esta, esta lógica de ver, de ver al bosque de manera integral. Sin duda este, estamos dando los pasos iniciales en este, en este proceso de integración, pero creo que, 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 que estamos avanzando en, 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 en concretar esta, esta visión y este mensaje de la, de la integralidad del bosque, ¿no? a partir de, de, de estas intervenciones concretas que, que, que son un, un primer paso. El, el, el otro tema y el otro reto con el cual tenemos que lidiar eh, tiene que ver con un reto con el cual tenemos que lidiar, tiene que ver con la fragmentación en la gobernanza de, de estos temas, el tema de diversidad biológica, el tema de, lo, de los bosques. ¿no? En, en, en el Perú, eh, estas competencias están eh, alojadas en, en, en más de una institución. Estamos trabajando muy, muy de cerca este, ahora con el Ministerio de Agricultura en la idea de, de, de trabajar la agenda de bosques, pero además trabajar la agenda de bosques integrada a una lógica más amplia de, de paisaje, integrada a los, a los paisajes productivos que rodean el bosque y que en muchos casos son los que generan la presión misma sobre el bosque y, y creo que ahí hay, un, hay un, una ruta este, interesante de explorar y de escalar hacia futuro. Gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. And, and if you, you have until 6.20, is this? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll continue and then I'll come back with a question. Yeah. Yeah. Pajero, please. So now we're going to spin around to the other side of the globe. And, uh, and hear a bit of a perspective from uh, another uh, mega diverse uh, country, uh, also, of course, extremely important in terms of uh, the potential emissions reductions from red. Actually, not that far, Steve. It's just across yes. the Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> we are on the yes. East Coast or the West Coast, and you are in the East yes. Coast, right? Yeah. Yes. Of the Pacific, on that matter. Yeah, I think the issue that is put here considering biodiversity, I was thinking earlier in terms of the biophysical matters, but now I realize when you mentioned that 10 billion has been put into GC, GC, GCF, and then I wonder, maybe the problem is, can we get the money of the GCF for biodiversity issues? Hmm. Because if that is a climate change money, and this is biodiversity issue and we are still seeing it separately, then it is accumulation of fund in one pot that you cannot access when actually the problem is a combination of both. So, and this is I think the issue here, we're talking about how to consider this biodiversity into that. We know that we are talking about uh, red plus biodiversity, uh, then we say that 
actually we are talking about conservation, we are talking about management, and we are talking about restorations. All three needs to be considered. If you are only talking about conservation and sustainable forest management, then you are not realizing that actually the elements of this red is actually sick. You look into the forest, half of your forest is sick. You look into the biodiversity, half of the biodiversity is sick. And you look into the social equity and social justice of the people living in the forest, half of it is sick. It may be 60%, maybe 70%. Because if in the past, the rights <laughs> and the presence of these people, the forest dwelling people was not recognized because they are not formal, then the sickness is because of the formality is a must. So you need to get from non-formal into formality and then give the rights and then protect that rights and continue make the development of the forest dwelling people in the right directions. So that is what I saw when I get into the issue of Red Plus in the first place. So for Indonesia, Red Plus is from the beginning beyond carbon and more than forest. When we are talking about just carbon incentive for that and only red as a climate change agenda can access the GCP, GGF money, then I think we are half blind. We need to see with both eyes, right? So having said that, that red plus in our context is basically beyond carbon means carbon plus, okay? And more than forest is not only the forest, but also the biodiversity inside it, because it also includes the ecosystem services provided by it. It also includes the issue of the GDP of the poor that is living, the forest dwellers that is living in the forest. Then you have to see the forest in a holistic way. And Red Plus is the program that will make the governance of the forest better in such a way that moving forward, you achieve sustainable growth with equity. Now, that is the initial thought, and that is what we are trying to implement there. Now, when it gets into, uh, into monetizing it, okay, because red relates to money, red relates to payment. People say that if you are doing an integrated uh, approach to save and conserve the forest, it's not enough. You have this now financial incentive. So how do you capitalize? How do you monetize what you're doing? People in the world, I mean, UNFCCC and others, is still talking about the money, the amount, the, sorry, the, the, the product, that, the commodity that can be considered is the cardboard. How do you now value half-life of an orangutan? How do you value the, the half part of the tiger or, or something like that? It's very difficult. So you don't have that yet. What is the value that you can give to the improvement of the development perspective of your forest dwelling people? The path that getting them into what they want later on. How do you value that? No figures yet, okay? Mm -hmm. Ecosystem services, there may be a way of paying that, but it's so diverse and so disintegrated. So we need to integrate that. Now, assuming that the way that you do that, monetize that, and the element that you can sell, the commodity that you can sell is actually carbon, then the question and actually the answer is, is the carbon that is coming from red the same value as the carbon that's coming from industrial? Uh, pollutions. Is the carbon that comes from the landscape affected or affecting uh, emissions the same value as from transportation or from waste? So if you now say that no, the carbon that we are selling from the forest is actually considering also you have the element of the livelihood, you have the element of the biodiversity, you have the element of the ecosystem surfaces, not only to that locations, but the rain that gets from the Amazon into the United States valued as well into that, then what you will happen, what will happen, is you have here a Tata Nano car and here a Ferrari, both red. See? <laughs> Okay, so are you buying Tata Nano red or are you buying Ferrari red? 
my argument is when you go into the carbon market, the red carbon must be a Ferrari red, not a Tata Nano red. I think I will stop there for now. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you very much. That's a nice image to thinking about that Ferrari. <laughs> Um, well, I would like to take advantage of the time that we have here with the Vice Minister to, uh, to uh, go ahead and ask him the first uh, follow-up question. And uh, I think it's really quite interesting that here in Peru, um, it's not specifically a red program, or, or I suppose there's a red program, but it's a red program that's inside of this much larger uh, forest and climates uh, program. Um, but, um, of, of course, um, getting to this point and, and ensuring that there is continued uh, coordination between the red entities and biodiversity is, uh, is a challenge, and a challenge that many countries, I think, still have not uh, answered yet. And I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on the, what are the biggest obstacles to uh, promoting some of the coordination uh, between the people that work on biodiversity in your government and those that are, are, are working on RED and maybe offer some other ideas about ways to overcome these challenges? A ver, por lo menos al nivel del Ministerio del Ambiente. Okay. Y no debería haber mayor problema porque en realidad eh, tanto la... El, la Dirección de Diversidad Biológica, la Dirección Nacional de Diversidad Biológica, como la Dirección Nacional de, de Cambio Climático y el Programa Nacional de Conservación de Bosques, dependen de mí, o me reportan a mí. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Sin embargo, la realidad es otra. O sea, la, la, las dinámicas de, de cada uno y, la, y la, o sea, la, la inercia que trae cada uno en función de los, de los vínculos que tienen con su constituency internacional o con, con, con el, el responder a, las, a los compromisos que tienen, hace que eso, que uno pensaría pues que puede ocurrir de manera espontánea, no, no, no ocurra y que requiere una, una intervención concreta. Por eso es que eh, o sea, eh, tenemos esta apuesta en la estrategia de, de, de bosques y cambio climático que permite hacer este, este puente, esta, esta conexión ¿no? entre, entre estos dos este, estas dos líneas de acción que han, que han funcionado en, en paralelo. Adicionalmente a eso hay la necesidad, o sea, esto que mencionaba anteriormente, del, del, del vínculo con el Ministerio de Agricultura, respecto, entendiendo además al Ministerio de Agricultura como el responsable o el rector en el, en el tema forestal en el Perú. Eh, con, lo, con lo cual la figura, la figura es, 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 es más compleja. Sí lo venimos trabajando a, a, a través de tener eh, para cada convención de Naciones Unidas, nosotros tenemos una, una comisión nacional que se encarga de impulsar la implementación de la estrategia nacional específica para cada convención. No tenemos, sin embargo, un espacio de articulación entre las comisiones nacionales que, ven, que siguen cada convención. Lo estamos intentando armar a partir de un, una nueva eh, mirada desde de, 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 de una, una integración de los acuerdos multilaterales ambientales, que, que incluye además algunas de las otras convenciones vinculadas al tema de diversidad biológica que no están, no están en el ministerio, la, 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 la Convención Internacional de Especies Migratorias, este, las convenciones o varias de las convenciones que están vinculadas al tema marino, que están o en la Cancillería o en el Ministerio de Agricultura, y eso viene pues de una tradición anterior a la existencia del ministerio. El Ministerio del Ambiente tiene seis años de existencia en el Perú, entonces todavía hay ahí mucho, mucho trabajo que hacer en, en, en intentar hacer que estos que estas, eh, compartimientos o especie de compartimientos estancos mm. empiecen a trabajar de manera, de manera articulada. ¿no? Creemos que, que esta estrategia enfocada no en red, sino en bosque, puede, puede permitir empezar a generar este, esta, esta bisagra, si se quiere, entre, en, en, entre las... Eh, espacios o los canales de discusión mm -hmm. de, cada, de cada tema. ¿no? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. Next question I'd like to ask is to Pajero. So you painted this nice picture of we have the, uh, the, the Ferrari, right? Uh, mm. um, and, uh, and, of, and of course that there are um, excellent opportunities that RED can contribute to biodiversity conservation, but, but we also know that there are trade-offs and that the RED program can be to, uh, uh, addressing many different things, livelihoods, as, as you had mentioned. 
uh, could you talk maybe a little bit about the, the uh, process for looking at, at, at these trade-offs and, um, and, uh, and, and trying to come up with some sort of an optimum outcome that can value the biodiversity and, and some of these other? Well, let me start by saying that if you start with understanding that your land, your forest, is half of that sick and half is healthy, and conservation, management, and restoration is the game, then perhaps the trade-off can be done by trying to heal the forest. Degraded land is there. So that if you're talking about increasing the production of your commodity in the agriculture that needs land, that originally, the, if you're thinking business as usual, you will cut the tree again to expand your, your land, you have to realize that we have sick land. You have the, I mean the sick land in the sense that degraded land, open forest already. In the case of Indonesia, I don't know in the case of Peru, but in the Indonesia, case of Indonesia, people say about 30 million hectares out of 100 million hectares, that is a lot. So what prevent the expansion into that directions given to that land that mm -hmm. already there? It's the law. The regulations is preventing that because the assumption that in that land there is still forest standing has not been corrected. So the first thing that needs to be done is correct the map, understand the locations, and go back into the re-registration of your forest, say the boundary, what can be used and what cannot be used, but that is very basic. Start from the basic, get into that. While doing that, at the same time, make sure that what you are going into is a clear and clean land. What this mean? That if in the past there is a sin from the government or from the economy to actually not giving the right respect for the rights of the people there, give the rights back. And so you can delineate in a better way what is accessible and what is not accessible, what is owned, what is not owned. That's the first thing. The second, when you are trying to do that, consider the people that is dwelling the, in the forest not as disturbed neighbor. Because if you are doing your plantation and the people get put aside and then you, all right, you are disturbed neighbor, I will give you candies. No, not anymore. In the next red, the red plus strategy of Indonesia, the people that is, the, the forest dwelling people are partners. So you need to work together with them so that they will get the benefit of the red program instead of just having in the safeguard, FPIC things, all right, I'll give you this because then you can live happily ever after with that amount of money. What is happily ever after? What I am happy with now will not be what I am happy with 15 years from now. So that development path needs to be made and agreed and planned together and implemented together. And the red is the facilitator for that. So it is going to be very complex, okay? When we are talking about that, what we are doing in Indonesia, Steve, is not only talking about carbon, not only about rel, not only about how to measure an MRV, but we are talking about green village. We are talking about green school making the education of the children, moving forward for the next generation, better equipped and better, in uh, what you call it, infused with the concept of green economy. So that is the activities that, can that be valued in terms of the carbon tonnage? No. Mm -hmm. But is that more than just the carbon tonnage value? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because if we can do that, then we can assure that moving forward, the final objective of the combat against climate change will be achieved. Mm -hmm. And that is what? The balance of the planet, the living planet, the living people, happy. Mm -hmm. So it will be necessary to get that money from the GCP. And one thing that we need to consider there, I am not so much, Pa Brulio, to agree in terms of the co-benefit terms. I will be using interdependent benefit terms. Mm -hmm. Because what the benefit here is actually Drink, uh, bringing the other benefit in, or when you are talking about this, and this is not well done, the other benefit sucker, uh, suffer, mm -hmm. okay? So you need to see that as an inter-benefit, interdependent benefit, mm -hmm. I will put beyond co-benefit into interdependent benefit. Mm -hmm. 
So I think with that, put that into the value of the Ferrari red, that it will be worth the Ferrari red. But how do you package that? How do you put that into the uh, market offering, so to speak, is perhaps the next agenda of the scientists. Help us in terms of creating that value that is an integrated value of red. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yeah, okay. So we will, we will uh, say goodbye, uh, but with thanks. much thanks to Vice thank Minister Kia Ki uh, Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. You have my card, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sí, claro, claro. Sí, gracias. Okay, okay, gracias. Yeah. gracias. No, we really appreciate him taking the time. This is obviously an extremely busy time for the, the, the Ministry of the Environment here in, in Peru right now. That's true. Um, so I would like to continue with one more a quick question to Mr. Diaz. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and you and your position, of course, are working with many uh, governments around the world and and we're hearing a government perspective and, and some of the things that government can do in order to try to achieve some of these synergies. Um, but I think that there's probably a, quite an important role also for, for civil society. Uh, we heard maybe the, the suggestion that there's an important role for additional, additional science, um, but I would like to hear maybe your, your, your thoughts on, on how uh, others in the audience here, we have quite a bit of civil society that participates in this event, um, can also be helping to, to build these synergies. Certainly. Well, I, I think in the end, uh, if we really want to address these issues and guarantee that the solutions we will be implementing, including by using the funding for under Red Plus, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that these solutions are sustainable, that they will survive year after year, we need to have good governance. So part of the problems that we face with deforestation, for example, uh, is uh, in many ways due to lack of uh, good governance. So lack of recognition of the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, uh, lack of adequate participation of the different stakeholders in decision making. And so I think we have to address this. And even though uh, Pajero is right that maybe some of, of these activities that we might be funding through Red Plus might not be directly being converted into carbon, but they will ensure the sustainability for these actions to the future. So mm -hmm. I think this has to be taken in, into account. Yes. So the issue of governance, uh, I think, is critical, and it was raised in the opening uh, panel here. Uh, um, I'm quite encouraged, for example, to see discussions under the CBD and other forum uh, an increased uh, uh, interest on um, the issues of governance. For example, under the Protected Areas Program of the CBD, we have been uh, developing a number of um, uh, capacity building regional workshops and guidance and tools. And we see a lot of interest in different governments to review their legal framework and uh, to really put in place better governance uh, systems. So during the parks, uh, the last Parks Congress in Sydney, Australia recently, um, we had a whole stream of events discussing governance of protected areas. And I was very pleased to see <coughs> presentations from governments of countries like Madagascar, Philippine, the Philippines, Iran, uh, telling us that they had reviewed their legal framework for protected areas, recognizing the whole range of categories and governance systems of, of, for protected areas. Because unfortunately, many countries are still restricted. Uh, they have the old, just uh, strict preservation uh, protected areas categories, which doesn't allow for adequate uh, uh, participation uh, of uh, uh, indigenous peoples, local communities, and to take into consideration their interests. And so, implementing the full range of these uh, uh, categories of protected areas is a way forward. We have examples in the local fisheries or inland fisheries, for example, in several countries showing that by uh, uh, having 
innovative arrange governance arrangement between the governments and the local fishermen communities, giving them exclusive rights for access to uh, uh, fisheries resources in certain areas, the communities then really start making decisions which are more sustainable for the long term because they see that any reduction in the fishing effort will reduce in benefits for them. Be and that's yeah. what we have been dealing with is the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. So the answer for the tragedy of the commons, which also affect the forestry area, is good governance. So I yes. think uh, uh, by having a more comprehensive strategy for funding for Red Plus, including the issues of governance, including the, uh, the needs and interests of local communities, indigenous peoples, I think is the right way. And having civil society uh, uh, participating fully and also helping to have an oversight to see whether things are being implemented in an uh, in appropriate way. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you. We are going to pass on to the second portion of the uh, of the event here with a couple of, of, uh, of presentations that go a little bit more into detail about uh, how uh, some of these issues of biodiversity conservation and red are being addressed. And, um, and at the end of these two presentations, then there'll be an opportunity for uh, comments to any of the panel uh, from the audience. Uh, so we're going to... Uh, begin with uh, uh, Valerie Kepos, um, who is the um, head of climate change, uh, head of the climate change and biodiversity program at UNEP WCMC, uh, to set a bit of the, uh, the uh, share a bit of her perspective, sitting at sort of a global level and engaging directly with with countries uh, on how to address this this specific issue. Okay, could I have the presentation, please? Yes. We have the, the yes. yeah. So what I'm going to tell you about is a little bit of work that we've done, in fact, in collaboration with the CBD Secretariat to ask this question of how far we're already taking account of the potential synergies between Red Plus and biodiversity. Some of us have been talking about these synergies for quite a long time, really since very early in the process. And the question is, they're, they're sort of obvious to many of us, but what's being done to really advance them. Uh, whoop, I always have a heavy finger for these. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Braulio gave us a quick skate through the Aichi targets, and he listed a lot more than I've put here, but I wanted, and these are heavily paraphrased, and he may not like my paraphrasing, <laughs> but I, they wouldn't fit on the slide otherwise, so this is pragmatic. Uh, but I wanted to remind you that there are many obvious ways in which RED can support achievement of the Aichi targets, obviously in the targets that specifically mention forests and carbon, but also in those that mention sustainable management, in protected areas, in those that address restoration. So this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, Braulio's list was much more comprehensive, but this is to remind you what we're talking about. People have acknowledged these potential synergies for a lot for as long as we've had the targets, really. Um, but we've begun to think a little bit more about what those complementarities really entail. And the point is not just that red outcomes will help to deliver biodiversity outcomes, but actually that some of the things you need to do for red and for achieving those biodiversity mm. outcomes are exactly the same things. You need some of the same kinds of actions you need some of the same kinds of planning processes, and you need some of the same kinds of information to support decisions and track outcomes. We've had mentions from several of our speakers today about, particularly from the Vice Minister who's now left, um, about how siloed or compartmentalized or fragmented we are in the work that we do. And one of the things that we were interested to see was what evidence there is and maybe what can be done in future to try to promote a little bit more, let's call it operational synergy between RED and biodiversity conservation so that we don't have these different um, processes going on in different ministries or different departments in the same ministry trying to answer the same questions. To look at how these potential synergies are being pursued at national level, um, there were two parts to our work with the CBD Secretariat. We carried out, we had held two workshops 
with red plus and biodiversity focal points, and we also did some national case studies of red and biodiversity conservation and B national biodiversity strategy and action plan documents. Um, I want to tell you a little bit very quickly about the workshops with the focal points. One of these was co-hosted by Comifac, which was fantastic because Comifac, being a regional forest coordination member country membership organization, had fantastic convening power. And we actually managed to get in the same room for five days, Red Plus focal points and CBD focal points from some countries. And in both that workshop and in the workshop which was held later in Costa Rica, we had several reports that these were the first time these people had met each other, <laughs> much less spent time talking to each other. Um, in fact, two of them, I won't name the country, spent a long time on an airplane together and found it very productive. So, you know, there, there's some really simple things we can do. We can lock people in rooms. It's, it's really Get quite helpful. Planes. So, and what these workshops concluded, and I can't actually see the bottom of this slide either, so yeah. I'm going to have to make it up as I go along. Um, but what we found when, when we got people into these rooms and they were talking to each other was that there was a sort of high level recognition of the potential for these synergies. And that people realized that an awful lot of whether you could realize these synergies depended on what you do, and especially how you do it. And that therefore the role of safeguards, yeah. whether they come from the CBD end or whether they are the proper Cancun safeguards and they're respect, respecting and addressing, respecting and addressing the Cancun safeguards, a lot, there's a very, very strong role there in helping to determine how we take action for RED and, or indeed, how we take action for biodiversity and what the, the impacts those actions will have. But there are challenges, and there are, um, some of those challenges the participants in the workshop raised were that the different agendas proceed at different rates within countries. Not only are they actually compartmentalized in different parts of government, for example, and indeed different parts of civil society, but things are moving forward at different rates. Um, if I can just remind myself what the last one is. Oh, resources. yes, the usual, the us, the usual challenge, capacity. which are resources, including financial resources and capacity resources. Um, whoa, that didn't work very well. Let's see where we are. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, this has crunched up a bit. So those were some of the conclusions from the workshops. I'm terribly sorry about the formatting on this. I had a, obviously mm. had a moment. Um, but... When we looked in depth at individual countries and we looked at sets of documents that were both biodiversity documents and Red Plus documents, so we looked at embryonic Red Plus strategies or indeed completed ones, we looked at national biodiversity strategies and action plans, many of which predated Red, but we looked at the update processes. And what we found was that there was a lot, there was some good evidence that things were going in the right direction. There was, for example, a good interministerial communication and participation in the, in the Philippines, that the red stakeholders were in the biodiversity NBSAP updating workshops, and the biodiversity stakeholders were in the Red Plus workshops. That in itself is progress. A few years ago, that wouldn't have been happening. Um, we also found that in a few cases, you know, there was actually explicit mention of particular actions. So in Central Africa, protected areas are listed as a major red strategy, and they clearly coordinate with the national objectives that have, are going into those revised NBSAPs. So that's, it's nice to see that explicit. Um, okay, my formatting has really caused problems. Um, I wanted also to highlight work that's been done by colleagues at um, the Forest Carbon Markets and Communities Program, who reviewed in very great depth 14 national Red Plus strategies and found that half included general statements. So again, here we are, this general awareness about biodiversity conservation and Red Plus and complementarities. But only two of those 14 reviewed, those 14 national program documents reviewed, those from Costa Rica and DRC, identified specific policies and measures to conserve biodiversity within Red Plus documents. So we have a ways to go. We have a ways to go. There are possibilities, but we have a ways to go. Whoop. Finally, my conclusions are very quick, and they pretty much summarize what I've already said already, so I won't go over time. But we need more specific policies and actions on both sides. We need better communication between decision makers and actors. And in particular, we need sharing. We had participants asking all the time 
for continued sharing of experience and practical examples of activities, data, and tools between countries. Mm -hmm. So not just between ministries, but between countries. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much, Val. Um, I, I, one, one point I thought that was um, really quite interesting there is that you saying that within your own analysis of the national documents, seeing progress, uh, that uh, you know, some some good reasons for hope that you're that that there is increasing awareness and and work towards synergies. And in fact, that FCMC study that you mentioned and that I worked on also showed a very quite a similar thing. And that the more advanced uh, documents, which in this case were the uh, ER uh, pins that were being prepared for the FCPF Carbon Fund, were the ones that showed that greater level of detail. And um, I think that is a, an encouraging sign. Um, so our third presentation here is uh, from uh, Mark DeClaro, uh, and uh, again, it's really uh, great that we've got a, a, another representative from a, uh, yet another mega diverse country. Uh, Mark is the um, head of the Red Unit in the Department of Natural Resources uh, in the Philippines, and uh, and he's going to give us a little bit of a, a perspective uh, about the um, uh, Red and Biodiversity issues in the Philippines. Thank you, Steve. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Good. Uh, I hope you will allow me to read some of my notes because I want to capture everything and I want to miss on very important points. So. We have the presentation? Yep. So I'll be talking about utilizing sp okay. spatial data and mapping for Red Plus and NBSAPs within the context of uh, the Philippines. So, first, uh, the 2012 Philippine Forestry Statistics of the Forest Management Bureau uh, showed that based on the visual interpretation of images of the Philippines taken from various Earth observation satellites like ALOS, Abner 2, SPAT 5, and Landsat, the total forest cover of the Philippines is estimated at 6.84 million hectares, or roughly 22% percent of the country's total land area of around 30 million hectares. Before it used to be 7.2 million hectares in 2003, it has gone down to um, 6.8 uh, million hectares right now. The, main, the management of the forest land bear, falls under the jurisdiction of the Forest Management Bureau where I, where I belong, of the Department of Environment and uh, Natural Resources. Oh, sorry. It jumped. It jumped. <laughs> However, while forest lands are managed by the Forest Management Bureau, it is the Biodiversity Management Bureau who is responsible for the conservation and management of the country's considerable network of 240 protected areas covering 5.45 million hectares. So, two different offices. Many of these protected areas are actually haven for the country's flora and fauna, which are among the most diverse in the world. Due to its geographical isolation, diversity of habitats, and high rates of endemism, the Philippines is one of 18 mega-diversity countries which together hold two-thirds of the Earth's biodiversity and approximately 70 to 80 percent of its animal and plant species. The Philippines is believed to harbor more di diverse, diversity of life than any other country on Earth on a per hectare basis. It is actually a paradise of biodiversity. However, the Philippines is also a country with a high number of threatened species, making it a biodiversity hotspot as well. Deforestation rates in the Philippines have dropped significantly in the last decade. While the country was among the top 10 countries contributing to greenhouse gas emissions from deforestation in the early to mid-2000s, according to the FAO, it had positive forest growth between 2005 and 2010. However, recent national analysis by NAMRIA indicate that there has been deforestation between 2003 and 2010 at a rate of over 328,000 hectares. We have annual forest cover loss of 46,954 hectares. So pressures on forests still exist, including from lagging, fuel wood gathering, and charcoal making, agricultural expansion, especially kaingin making, it's the slashing and burning of uh, the understory and trees as part of shifting cultivation, and of course, infrastructure expansion. Now, in order to counteract the negative trends, the Philippine government has adopted a series of policies and strategies to address the pressures to forest and biodiversity. 
In 2010, it endorsed the Philippine National Red Flag Strategy, which was developed with the participation of civil society and non-governmental organizations. The strategy encompasses a 10-year time frame from 2010 to 2020, consisting of a readiness pace of three to five years, followed by a gradual scaling up to a five-year engagement pace. Philippine Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan is the primary instrument for implementing the Convention on Biological Diversity at the national level, and that was first completed in 1997. Following the 10th Conference of the Parties to the CBD in 2010, the Philippines has been updating its NBSAP on an ongoing basis to reflect the goals of the strategic plan and the IGE biodiversity targets. This process is actually ongoing. Furthermore, the Philippine government issued a lagging moratorium in natural forest through Executive Order Number 23. The President has imposed a lagging ban in all natural forests nationwide in 2011, the first in our history. This is to stop further depletion of our forest. Now, to expand our forest cover, our President established the biggest reforestation program in our history, the National Greening Program in 2011, through Executive Order Number 26. We intend to plant 1.5 billion trees in 1.5 million hectares in six years. We will plant more trees in six years than what we have planted in the past 50 years. Now, action for Red Plus under the UNFCCC can contribute towards achieving the IHE biodiversity targets and vice versa. However, how national biodiversity strategy and action plans and Red Plus activities are ultimately planned and implemented is key to determining the extent of synergies and complementarities. For us as decision makers, maps can serve as useful tools as they can support spatial planning, are often rapidly produced, customizable, and easily communicated. Spatial analysis exercises can serve as a useful tool for exploring where actions for Red Plus may also complement or further promote the country's commitments under the CBD and help it realize the IHE biodiversity targets. For example, IHE biodiversity target number 12 was the ambition to prevent the extinction of known threatened species and improve and sustain their conservation status by 2020. If spatial information on threatened species is available, a spatial analysis exercise for Red Plus could look at where areas of importance for Red Plus actions are in relation to areas which contain high concentrations of threatened species to see the extent of overlaps. Now, the mapping exercises that are shown in the following slides aimed at exploring uh, areas in the Philippines where there are likely to be synergies between actions which contribute to the IG biodiversity targets and, and, and Red Plus. Now, the spatial analysis of The spatial analysis of drivers of deforestation, biophysical and threatened species data, as well as potential for multiple benefits was undertaken in the frame of the Red Pack project, as you may know, funded by the German Federal Ministry for the Environment. Uh, this was mentioned a while ago. The, the report, as shown in the, on the right, and this presentation are the outcomes of a national workshop conducted by the United Nations Environment Program World Conservation Monitoring Center in October 2013 with uh, the Department for Environment and Natural Resources. The workshop aimed to demonstrate how spatial data can be used by national decision makers to inform where Red Plus could also help to meet the country's biodiversity conservation targets under the CBD. So it supported the identification of priority areas for Red Plus actions that, that enhance benefits and aimed at raising awareness on the benefits from the forest. So those are the IG biodiversity, just to remind us. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even now, uh, <laughs> oh, it went back. So, joint planning for implementation of the IG. Oh, yeah, of the IG biodiversity targets and Red Plus holds great relevance for a country such as the Philippines, having ratified both the CBD and the Kyoto Protocol under the UNFCCC. The Philippines is currently in the process of revising its N NBSAP under the CBD and has had a Red Plus strategy in plan since 2010. Now, since responsibilities for CBD and uh, Red Plus implementation are held by different bureaus, FMB and BMB, within the DNR, the exercise to explore synergies between IHG targets and Red Plus constituted an opportunity to increase coordination 
and enhance likely synergies and minimize uh, any conflict. Uh, I want to show you some slides on some maps. Oops. Yep. You have to do it there. Like this one, uh, reducing deforestation and uh, forest degradation. These are information on past trends in, in forest cover alongside an understanding of the drivers of deforestation and uh, forest degradation. It can support both NBSAP and REP plus planning. Additionally, REP plus requires information in existing carbon stocks in forest. Now, you know what? Understanding the locations of illegal lagging uh, in relation to carbon can therefore support planning for REP plus and IG biodiversity target number five. IHG biodiversity target number five is specifically about natural habitats. So the illegal lagging hotspots indicate where there is pressure from forest degradation, as can be shown in the slide. Map also shows the relation of biomass carbon and illegal lagging hotspots to areas of importance for, for biodiversity, which may th therefore be particularly important natural habitat. So this data include important bird areas and areas important for other taxa, which are identified at the country level according to nationally agreed uh, criteria. Now, in this next slide that I will show you, it has something to do with uh, reducing forest degradation. Wildfires pose a hazard in the Philippines, particularly in the summer. They originate from land being cleared for agriculture. So for example, can in making. Accidental fires that spread through the forest and human settlement next to forests, which have increased the frequency and intensity of wildfires in the Philippines has also been linked to global warming and the El Nino phenomenon. So the map shows the distribution of areas, high threatened species richness in relation to the fire occurrence between January and June 2013, which falls mostly in the dry season in the Philippines. The species richness layer is based on species ranges of threatened mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. The map also shows the boundaries of the ancestral domains, recognizing the role of the indigenous people in the conservation of threatened biodiversity. So forest fires are an important concentration under any future national red plus mechanism. Strategies which aim to prevent forest fire under red plus will help guarantee the permanence of carbon stocks, reduce risk associated with forest regeneration, and sustainable management of forest. So I still have a few, few more slides. Increasing the effective management and extent of protected areas is the focus of the IHG biodiversity target number 11. And uh, that by 2020, at least 70% of terrestrial inland water and 10% of coastal marine areas, especially areas of particular importance for biodiversity and ecosystem service, are considered to effectively and equitably managed ecologically representative and well-connected systems. Now, protecting areas, the point is protecting areas in high, high in biodiversity and carbon, which are also under threat, can have large benefit for both benefits for both red plus and NBSAP objectives. So the brown there is the, the, the carbon. This map shows the locations of areas which are high in carbon, important for threatened species and the location of protected areas. So red plus actions including increasing the effectiveness and extent of protected areas in areas important for threatened species and which are high in carbon have the potential to co contribute towards emissions reduction and IHG biodiversity target 12 which aims to prevent the extinction of known threatened species and improve and sustain their conser conservation status by 2020. So actions relevant to Red Plus and the IG biodiversity targets do not just include reducing deforestation and forest degradation. The sustainable management of forests is also one of the five Red Plus activities and closely related to IG biodiversity target number seven that by 2020, Areas under agriculture, aquaculture, and forestry are managed sustainably, ensuring conservation biodiversity. The map provides an overview of the distribution of areas under the Community-Based Forest Management Agreement in relation to key biodiversity areas. It shows where sustainable management of forests could be implemented as an activity under Red Plus in a way which also contributes to biodiversity conservation. So. Briefly put, uh, spatial analysis can support planning for ecosystem services, such as soil erosion control. 
It allows uh, exploring where existing forests play an important role in preventing soil erosion and where forest restoration could potentially reduce soil erosion. The latter could potentially inform site selection under the, the NGP. All right, down to my last two slides, last slide. Now, initial mapping results guided the updating of the PBSAP, Philippine Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans, which is likely to be published this December. Uh, pinpointing potential priority areas for conservation, identifying critical areas for reforestation, pin up gaps in intervention and conservation actions. To conclude, in the Philippines, there are concrete opportunities for linking Red Plus actions with those aiming at Aichi biodiversity targets. Maps can support identifying and planning those actions by pr prioritizing areas important for biodiversity and Red Plus, planning for reducing deforestation, sustainable forest management, and planning for the conservation or enhancement of ecosystem services. Finally, as uh, planning for Red Plus and the IHG biodiversity targets moves forward, the implementation of NBSAP and Red Plus activities will ultimately determine the extent to which synergies are achieved. So, muchas gracias. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Great. Well, that, that uh, gives us a visual, uh, and we've heard several comments here about mapping, and, uh, and now we actually get to see what some of these uh, look like um, in the flesh. Um, so now it's the time that, um, hopefully, as you've been seeing these, uh, you've, you've, uh, some questions have, have popped into your minds, and, uh, and we'd, we'd welcome any questions to come from the audience and for any of the panelists, and if you can please identify yourself and, um, uh, and your institution. I think we have a microphone. Um, or, uh, yeah. Good afternoon and thank you very much to all presenters. I'm Michael Bucchi from the European Commission, Brussels. Um, thanks very much. Um, it, it's fascinating to, to hear you talking and creates a lot of ideas. Uh, I, I would like to talk to the idea of the red Ferrari versus the red uh, Tata. Um, the the, the catch-22 that we are in is that everybody understands that we would rather drive the red Ferrari, but we would rather pay for the, for the uh, red Tata. I don't know. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, we, that's because we don't see the benefits of the Ferrari, or we see the price tag is too high. Um, and it, the, the benefits of biodiversity of governance, in, of course, cannot be quantified in terms of uh, emission reductions in a given year. But over the time, over time, they, they can be quantified in a reduction of a risk. Um, and so, what I mean is that we have growing evidence in, in Europe, for instance, that uh, biodiverse forests are less likely to die back due to extreme climate events, uh, or that, uh, or that governance could, could mean that people are more satisfied with their environment and ecosystems and, and therefore they are more likely to conserve them and not converse them, convert them. So this notion of risk of these elements that you call interdependent benefits, uh, that, that they, they reduce the risk of losing the carbon, of just transferring the risk elsewhere, like um, reducing the risk that people start importing uh, food that they use to produce themselves or that they um, uh, just migrate because they are not happy uh, enough with, with where they used to live. These, these elements are meaningful in terms of mitigation, of sustainable mitigation. So the quantification of risk associated with bad biodiversity or bad governance, I think, is, is, a, is a fertile ground. I don't know if you had a look into that. <clears throat> Shall I answer straight or? Um, let's, is there another? If maybe we will take another question or two if we've got it, and uh, otherwise you can be thinking of your question and we'll, we can come back. But is there a, a, uh, someone else with a hand up here? Yeah. There's one there. Yeah. Great. And another one. There. Okay. Thank you very much, Mitomori from uh, Japan International Cooperation Agency, and uh, I really enjoyed the theme and uh, uh, speaker's presentation. My question is the uh, the uh, IPBES is I think the, is the very initial stage of the discussion, and it has a lot of the linkage 
to the lead plus and the I, I would like to know the how to the, the, if you have any plan to how to integrate the discussion of IP best to the lead plus or the bio D. And also the, the other thing is the lead plus will be implemented uh, after 2020, I, I believe the, the, the time schedule of the each target is slightly different. The, how, how do you uh, corroborate the, the, the time schedule of the lead plus and each target? Thank you very much. Wow. Okay. okay. And one we'll take one the, more and then we'll have some uh, responses here. In the center. Thanks. Uh, my name is Bob O'Sullivan from FCMC and also from Terra, so one of the co-sponsors of, of, of this event, uh, this, this session. So my question, we've heard from, from the CBD Secretariat and also from the others around what's been going on on the international level, you know, what CBD decisions there are, also about what, what UNFCCC COP decisions there are, and you know, we're at the negotiations right now. So I guess to all the panelists, do you see there's a need for more decisions at the international level, either under the, the CBD or under the UNFCCC, to try and um, um, make greater linkages between the CBD and the UNFCCC on biodiversity and red? Or do you think now we have enough of the high-level guidance and now it's just getting down to the national level? There's, there's enough understanding what needs to be done. It's just a matter of going ahead and doing it. So a general question to, to all of the panelists. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, I think it sounds like we have an eager... <laughs> will the response. Ferrari run far? Yeah. Or will the Tata Nano run further with the same amount of fuel? I think that is, seems to be the questions here in terms of the risk, in terms of that uh, sustainability. Uh, I believe that what we are trying to do here is half scientific and half experimentation. So when you're talking about doing this carbon market, getting it on with the fund that is there, public funding, private investment, market facilitation, those kind of a combination of fund that we are talking about, and the price of the carbon is just one element that put into the equation. Now, definitely it is true that how do you actually measure the value of the biodiversity that you put into the tonnage of carbon? How do you really measure the, the happiness or the progress that is given to the forest dwelling people into the price of the carbon? I mean, those are equations that is quite complex. And, and uh, my suggestion is that if actually some scientists can get together and make a model and just like when we get to Aceh after the tsunami and start, people ask, where do you start? And we don't know where to start, we just throw stones and then we will start there. And take the risk, uh, that is actually an experimental that will need to get proven. But if you don't move, you are not getting it. So my suggestion is actually having that study, maybe not as robust as it should, but make use of that comp component and try to do a, a, a transaction. My suggestion for the transaction, it should be bilateral. If you do that on the multilateral, then the conditions from the 190 countries will prevent you from getting into something that is more productive. Okay? So my idea is that if we can do that and agree with our buyer in whatever form, whether it is a, uh, what, uh, a credit offset, or is it something that is more in the public kind of a funding into those uh, major uh, experiment and interaction, then let's do it. We can go through the early mover. We can go to the uh, understanding that works with a particular country as, as our partner. And, and if we can do that, then, then it is proof of concept, right? So you have a proof of concept, and you can do the proof of applications when you have that numbers already accepted. I think it will be needing some of that courage and some of that willingness to think for the better good moving forward. 
that we do that experiment. Okay, it's not 100% uh, solution that is clean up front, but you don't get into brand if you don't go from the uh, real fossil fuel at the beginning, right? So you have to do that process of getting it uh, uh, refined moving forward. So I understand there will be a risk. Mm -hmm. Post 2020, is red only limited to post, if I understand the question right, okay? Or what is going to happen after that? I don't know, we are talking about Kyoto Protocol, we are talking about uh, 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 Aichi target, okay, and you're talking about Nagoya. It seems that everything is pointed to Japan. <laughs> but when you are converging it and you're talking about, well, is Japan something that is short sighted? I don't think so. Japan is talking about 3,000 year kingdom. I mean, this is something that is talking about longevity. And we are talking about climate change, we are talking about landscape, we are talking about the sustainable development that will go intergenerations. So if our mindset is only until 2020, or 2030, or 2050, just the your New York Declaration of Forest, I think that is still very myopic. You go to the Yosemite, plant, uh, the, uh, Yosemite uh, Park and see what is the size of that forest, how long does it been there? I mean, that is 50 years, 30, 50 years of New York Declaration of Forest is still very, very young. We just have this tall of that sequoia forest. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it has to be long term. My perspective yeah. on that is that way. Yeah, great, thank you. So about this question of, uh, of, of additional formal guidance or agreements, uh, you know, do we have enough in the international agreements to uh, try to push these synergies uh, or, uh, or what needs to be done there, Mr. Diaz? Right, well, I, I want to refer to this and to the other questions quickly. Uh, I think we have quite a lot of uh, uh, decisions at global level. Maybe we have enough. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, there's challenges in promoting the synergies at all levels. As we are discussing here in this uh, Global Landscape Forum, uh, most of the policies are sectoral policies. Most of the agencies are sectoral. So it's a challenge to bring together a, at, the, at the national level, subnational level, regional and global level, to really uh, integrate more the, the policies. And, and that's what we need. So perhaps we still need to uh, uh, go uh, further in, uh, in developing appropriate uh, uh, mechanisms, forum, whatever, to, to support uh, the synergy. So all the countries under the CBD, for example, they always agree we need to promote synergies, but it doesn't happen. So it's a challenge. So we have to create some mechanism to facilitate for that. For example, we're now in the process of preparation for the, the third uh, conference on disaster risk reduction that will take place in Sendai in, in March. And uh, the UN is trying to promote more attention to prevention, to re reduce the, uh, the risks and the intensity of uh, uh, the, disasters. the disasters. But uh, most countries uh, uh, engage in the preparations for Sendai, uh, they're only concerned about how to make the best use of the money available for relief ac action. So it's a we, we still need uh, to make that uh, change it, it, that requires a mindset change. So people are still in the old mo mode and we need to, uh, uh, to shift towards more prevention, which is more cost effective. And of course, discussing prevention of disaster risk, it means investing in conservation, ecosystem restoration, reduction of deforestation. So the whole agenda we're discussing here is relevant. Uh, in terms of uh, the higher costs associated with a, 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 a Ferrari approach uh, towards uh, Red Plus, we have to see this as investment, yes. not as cost. So there will be returns to society, not only environmental benefits, but social and economic benefits. So we have to 
be uh, uh, better capable of capturing all these different uh, values uh, of uh, returns from these investments. And as was mentioned by uh, uh, the person that made the question, uh, there's other uh, side benefits. So, of course, having uh, more biodiversity-rich forests, uh, of course, it means that they ha are more resilient uh, uh, to disasters and to climate change, and they are more capable of uh, adapting to climate change. So these things have to be taken uh, into account. Yes. The issue of the IT targets uh, 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 being targets uh, for 2020 and the post-2015 development agenda with the proposed SDGs being targeted for 2030, there's a, an apparently mismatch. But the IT targets are clearly understood as uh, just a first step, right, in that countries would see that by making efforts, uh, additional efforts to achieve the IT targets by 2020, that will put governments in, a, in countries in a much better position to achieve the SDGs tar targets for the next, uh, next decade. So they have to be seen as uh, complementary yeah. and, and, and steps in a long-term process. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I see as completely uh, uh, compatible. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Um, Okay. Steve, can I, can I comment on, uh, okay. to, to add into that? Just, just for the sake, I mean, a statement of Gabriel was very interesting. When he mentioned the difficulties of coordinating within the country, within the government, and he said that each sector has their international partner. So with the sector of Ministry of Environment having connected with UNEP, another connected with FAO, another connected with UNDP, for instance, and their agenda is actually strengthening the silo mm -hmm. from national to international. Mm -hmm. That is very tough to have the ministry within the country to talk to each other. I will better talk to UNEP, and UNEP is saying no, and this is FIO is saying no, and then, I mean, and that is something that we experience actually uh, in the real life. So the UN Red, sorry, the Red Plus program in Indonesia, talk to the Secretary General, I need to have one UN service to us. And that's why we created UN Orchid, because by doing that, I, we are actually limiting the complexity of the extended silo. So that we can have that and connect it to And that. that's why the post-2015 development agenda process is so important, because once adopted, it will certainly encourage each country to create a more integrated yeah. process to discuss uh, sustainable development and integrate the different ministries and process. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's just an addition. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Okay? Mm. Yeah. Well. Is this working? Can I come in? Can people hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Definitely. I just wanted to come in with one more thing about do we need more decisions or more Excellent. guidance. I think we've heard this week that we're very unlikely to get any guidance. Um, and I don't, I'm not sure that we need it. I think what we need is sharing of experience. I mean, we are seeing progress in places in fragmentary ways. Individual countries have individual successes. And I think that if we can share those incremental bits of progress between countries in a rather more active way than we've been doing so far. We've got a good way of getting guidance without having guidance, if you know mm. what I mean. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Great. Okay. And Mark, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Oh. Yes. I think you were just you, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. So I want to comment on how to create synergies, like for example in the Philippines, what we're doing right now. Some of us are attending the UNFCCC, but uh, the other group, the other office, the biodiversity group is attending the CBD. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, right now we would like to uh, have some coordination. So some of us will also attend the CBD, just so that we could, you know, uh, have an effective collaboration. And um, also in our in the drafting of our safeguards uh, framework and guide. guide Guide, guidelines, we have included therein already um, uh, some of the IHE biodiversity targets 
Yeah. Uh, like, for example, in the environmental risk, we've identified uh, biodiversity loss. So we are integrating uh, the IG biodiversity targets with that of the red blast uh, activities. So that's what we're doing. I, I, I personally, I believe that we should go beyond turfing yeah. <laughs> uh, jurisdictions and mandates. You know? And I, I think we really have to get our acts together and be united. Great. Okay. Well, I know that we are um, after time, and and uh, and I know that uh, this is right now at seven o'clock is uh, when the knowledge sharing fair uh, is happening um, here on the third floor. I believe that there's a reception with um, with some beverages, etc., that that come with that. So I don't want to keep you uh, from from that. Um, I do want to point out that the. Um, the uh, FCMC has a booth uh, over in this area, and uh, and some of the work uh, that was referred to here um, is available there at the FCMC booth. So I'd encourage you to go and uh, and visit the stand if you're uh, interested in, in this. Um, I just want to point to a few of the the, the topics or, or things that kind of jumped out at me as we went went through this. Um, one, uh, you know, Val talked about the value of having people that are uh, just getting the people that work on red and biodiversity uh, from the governments together in the same room, and that um, in some cases, uh, uh, you know, just just creating that space has is, is turned out to be um, really uh, very uh, valuable. Um, so that's an example, perhaps, of a very cheap fix. Um, but um, but then we also, of course, have to recognize that um, it's not just a matter of. Uh, uh, people working in a very uh, a siloed way uh, for no good reason, that there are these links to uh, lots of other international, uh, uh, international obligations, links to international institutions, which, uh, which, which make it a bit simpler than just putting people together um, in the room uh, all the time. Um, another thing that jumped out is uh, about the importance of, of spatial analysis. Um, and, the, and the mapping, and, uh, and we saw some very interesting work that's being done in the Philippines to try to take advantage of that. Um, and those tools are increasingly being used, I think, by more, more countries uh, in the prioritization of their, of their red investments. Um, and uh, we heard some really interesting comments uh, about the need to have some, some courage, I think, to uh, invest in the um, biodiversity benefits. Perhaps it's not possible, we don't have the science necessary. So those are just a, a few of the things that, that jumped out at me through this. Um, we are very uh, thankful for the participation of all of our, our panelists here and also to you for your uh, interest in, in the session today. And uh, we look forward to, to interacting with you um, here in the, in the hallways of this event. Thank you. Thank you.